and prayed. Your word tells us that you sang hymns with your brothers and sisters, that you were as fully human as we are. And this is why we don't have an unsympathetic high priest. That while you lived and you breathed and you died, you were very, 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 very human. But yet three days later, we stand on the other side of the, of the resurrection and you are not human. You are God, you are sovereign, you are good, you are forever. You are saving grace. You are loving open arms, you are forgiveness. You look at us and say, you are enough. You are welcome here. Father, we live in the light of the cross and ask this morning um, that you give us open heart and open ears to uh, listen to the word that you have delivered to Pastor Joe today. In light of the cross, we ask for humility knowing that we didn't have to take a cross. So we ask for humility. We ask for tender hearts. We ask for hearts that are not made of stone but are made of flesh. We ask you to renew and transform our minds the way your word promises us that it will. We thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for this place. We thank you for arms that were open wide and welcomed us to the foot of your cross. In the name of your son, amen. You may be seated. Pretty good. You know, part of what makes a worship band so good is not just the musicians, and trust me, we have some literally some of the best in the city. They do this every week without computers or underlying tracks. They do it all themselves live. It's really pretty amazing what they put together. But there's more to it than just having good musicians. Another thing that makes a worship band good is understanding theology, knowing Jesus. And um, Megan and the band does a great job every week, and today was off the chain, man. That was good stuff. I'm Joe Davis. I'm not as good a musician as any of them. Uh, I'm the pastor here for Easter Sunday. I think it's our third Easter together, something like that. Third Easter at Grace Life. Today, the message is titled Resurrecting Orphans. Some of you say, wait a minute, that's not what we signed up for on Easter Sunday. So typically, an Easter sermon is about the joy and hope we have in the resurrection story of Jesus, which is a great one. <clears throat> and we come to Easter Sunday. Some of us maybe don't come as often as we should. We struggle. Life gets busy, gets full. But we come on Easter because, frankly, we are somehow looking for a way to connect with Heavenly Dad at a deeper level, especially on this day, right? I mean, in the end, isn't that what we want Easter to be about? Not about the Easter eggs or the chocolate, although I love the chocolate, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but what we want to have happen, actually, if you're honest, is on Easter Sunday that we will have a special connection to God that will transform us going forward because we all know we, we need it. And we want to connect with a greater understanding of how to be connected with Heavenly Dad. And so we come, frankly, to Easter with pretty high expectations. And, and trust me, as a minister staff and as a pastor, I feel that. I'm not kidding. I feel it. But this year, by request, which I don't normally, I, you know, I'm not like a top 40 DJ. Hey, Pastor Joe, can you <laughs> preach that sermon? <clears throat> but several people made a request that I preach a sermon about adoption, and I've titled it Resurrecting Orphans. And so this is the sermon preview from this week, one of them. I sent out two this week. One of the most heartwarming stories in Scripture is Heavenly Dad's adoption of his children. <clears throat> adoption carries this incredibly heartwarming idea of someone taking on the joys, responsibilities, costs an unbelievable privilege of raising a child. It's an amazing thing. There are people in this room who have been touched by adoption on both sides. Adoption is an incredible example, a picture of salvation in so many ways. 
And today, instead of preaching on the resurrection story, I will be preaching instead a sermon about one of the impacts of the resurrection of Jesus. That being this doctrine of adoption that's all throughout the New Testament that is made possible by the resurrection power of Jesus. How heavenly dad resurrects spiritually dead orphans. We will meld the story of resurrection with the precious, precious doctrine and comfort of adoption. How adoption can leave us with that Easter connection we so desperately crave. Maybe we don't even realize that we're craving it, but we do. And we will walk through the process through which Heavenly Dad, through His resurrection power, makes us His own. To understand this concept, we must first understand the actual plight that we have as children of darkness. And that is this. We have, spiritually speaking, initially the worst dad ever. He is a father of lies, a father of darkness, a father of deception that has one desire. He wants to see all his kids die with him. So let me explain why this is crucial. You know, the psychological importance of a father in the life of a child, especially they say between the ages of like four to 18 or 19, the most important place that a child develops their personal self-worth and their self-image is how they connect it to their relationship with their dad. The influence of a dad in a child's life is very important. And look, earthly dads, we struggle. Even when we're at our very best, we fail. But imagine, if you would, even as earthly dads, full of our flaws and struggle, we don't wish the worst on our children. Imagine if you had a father that absolutely hated you, wished you were dead, and wanted to see your life on the way to being dead a total shambles. This is what we inherited. There is no concept out there in the Bible. We hear this about, we're all born God's children. Actually, the scripture says the total opposite. We are not born God's children. No. Ephesians uh, 2, 1 through 3 says this, <clears throat> and you he had to make alive, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of our mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. John 8, 43 and 44, the words of Jesus. Why is my language not clear to you? In other words, why is it you can't understand what I'm saying? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Let me tell you something. I've taught this many times. And parents, you know this. <clears throat> Our children don't need depravity training. Now listen, Johnny, when I tell you to pick that toy up, you're to say no and storm off. Get it right the first time. No, we are born with this instinct of rebellion, selfishness, scandal. We don't have to send our kids, I've used this joke many times, we don't have to send our kids to lying camp. This is the natural spiritual condition all of us are born with. It's the reason our natural tendency, even as children, is selfishness. And we have, because of the DNA of our spiritual father, the devil, we have one desire. To fulfill the lust of our flesh. That's the natural DNA of our father, the devil. You know what makes it worse? Not only are we born with all his stuff that's bad, he knows all of our weaknesses. 
He knows where he can hurt us the most. He knows exactly what will bring us down mentally, emotionally, physically. And he wants to hide the truth from us. He wants us to live in a total destructive dysfunction. He wants us stuck in a swirling, sucking eddy of despair of his own making. He wants a tragic, eternal ending for all of us. He wants to bring us down with him. I mean, imagine if your biological dad wanted to kill you. I mean, look, us earthly dads are flawed. And our own flaws do inflict pain on our kids unknowingly many times. But could you imagine if the only thing an earthly dad wanted was to cause his children pain? Imagine what life would be like, especially on earth, when you're young and helpless. Church, listen to me. This is who we are spiritually before Jesus. It is. We are spiritual orphans, dead in sin, and our Father, our Father's enemy number one. So that's the dark part of this Easter message. I want to talk about adoption through resurrection power. <clears throat> even in the midst of having the DNA of our spiritual father, the devil, even in the midst of having our own natural depravity that we don't have to be taught, we have this natural <clears throat> innate desire to be connected to a different father who loves us. We know it's a desperate need, but we really can't even verbalize it. But as we see in scriptures, we are born of this other dad who wants the exact opposite. So how do we as children of a father that's just itching to kill us become children of God? Paul uses the picture of adoption in his epistles. And he explains how spiritually dead children of darkness become amazing, glorious children of light couple of verses I want to read to you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3, the second half through verse 5. <clears throat> Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the goodwill of his pleasure. Adoption is never something forced on anyone. It's a choice, and our heavenly dad has made a choice. Through his good pleasure, he has chosen to adopt us, even though our spiritual father, the devil, wants to kill us. Galatians chapter 4, 3 through 7. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, here's the Easter part, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying Abba, the Hebrew word for the most endearing term for father you can think of, daddy. That's what Abba means, daddy, father. He says that's the way we begin to look at God, not as judge, not even as creator, but simply daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, not only are you are a son, but you're an heir to everything that God has. Look, I could have laid on you about 10 more passages about adoption. These are good enough, don't you think? But the fact is, without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no resurrection for dead souls. This is not possible <clears throat> without power over death. Let me explain. This adoption process that Paul describes is founded upon Heavenly Dad having this amazing ability to resurrect us as dead spiritual orphans. And adoption is made possible through the de death and resurrection power of our Savior, our brother, Jesus. <clears throat> Look at this one, Ephesians 2, 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, 
because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we are still dead in trespasses, what does he do? Makes us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. This is the tie to the resurrection. Makes us alive together with who else that is alive? Our brother Jesus. This is the resurrection. This is the tie to Easter Sunday. Even while we were dead, he makes us alive. By grace, you have been saved. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a little <clears throat> gloomy, I guess, to describe the absolute miraculous glory of what I mean by resurrecting orphans. I think the best way to describe this so that you leave with an indelible picture in your mind <clears throat> is the picture of a dirty, smelly orphanage. So you go into this orphanage, you decide you're going to rescue some of the kids here, as many as you can, and make them your own. They line up the children for you to choose, starting with the absolute best ones. Oh, these are smart. They've got a great personality. Look at that smile. They come from a good family. These are good babies. These are good children. Yeah, they are. They're beautiful. Do you have some that maybe aren't so good? Some maybe that aren't so beautiful? Do you have any like that? Well, we do have some sick children. They're struggling. There's a couple that we've given up on. We don't think they're going to make it. And there's two, frankly, that have already died. Tell you what I want you to do. Show me the ones that didn't make it. Excuse me? Yeah, take me to the ones that you've given up on. Show me the ones that are dead. What? Yeah, I want to adopt those. Why, why would you do that? That's what Heavenly Dad does. He reaches, he reaches to the orphanage of dead souls. He reaches down, raises us up through the power of resurrection, and he makes us his own transforms us, turning us into his own children, implanting his supernatural, eternal DNA into our lives. Church, don't kid yourselves. We are all, before Jesus, dead orphans with no hope of life. Except for that miraculous moment of resurrection and adoption by a heavenly dad through Jesus, our brother, who gave his life and conquered the grave so that our new father could go into the orphanage and just say, show me the dead ones. Those are the ones I want. How does this happen? It happens through the gift of faith, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works, lest you should brag. See, not only does he choose us as dead orphans out, take us out of that dirty orphanage of souls, rescuing us from the father that wants to kill us, but he gives us the gift of faith that will allow us to trust our new father explicitly. We before had a dad we couldn't trust. He let us down time after time after time, he led us into addiction. He led us into lying. He led us into stealing. He led us into immorality. He led us into broken relationships. He led us into broken promises. He led us to dead end and hopelessness time after time after time. We have been betrayed by him over and over again, and we have lost the chance to trust in a dad. But our new father swoops in resurrects us, gives us life, and the gift of faith that he is just the father that we need. And he enables us to believe in this process of resurrection and redemption of our own souls. He takes away our foolish, stupid, arrogant pride in our own dead selves and gives us to reason to brag about our new dad. Oh, yeah, you think your dad is great? My previous dad left me for dead, but my new dad can resurrect dead orphans. He's awesome. 
Think of this, church. We were orphans in the orphanage of lifeless souls that really, frankly, if you're honest, should be totally unattractive to anyone, especially an all-holy, perfect, awesome God. But then instead, he resurrects us, gives us an undeserved place of honor, just as he would if we were his own child. He raises us up, the scripture says, raises us up to sit with him. You know what, by, you know what it means by raises us up to sit with him? We get all his stuff. We get all his stuff. I have ripped them from their natural dad, and I will make them my very own, no matter what the cost. So now I want to talk about our own personal Easter. Our new dad's adoption love has given us a new purpose a new joy, a new direction. We are empowered by our new resurrection life to do things that please our new heavenly dad, Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we walk in. And many of you know I, I translate that trip over. Previously dead spiritual orphans touched, transformed, by resurrection power, now become children who live to please their new dad. You know, I used to call when the day that God saved me, I was in ninth grade, and I remember when it happened, when God saved me. I used to call, yeah, God saved me then. At first you say I was saved, then I realized, no, that's not right. God saved me. But a few years ago, I even changed that. You know what I call it now? I call it my adoption day. And each day, my heavenly dad is infusing his spiritual DNA, making us more like him. So we see that Easter isn't just about the resurrection of Jesus. Otherwise, it's just, frankly, a nice magic trick. If it's just about the resurrection story, then there really is no point. But it's so much more than that. For God's children, Easter is also a celebration of our own resurrection our own adoption day it's why I don't refer to that day I became a Christian anymore as the day I was saved I was dead in sin because my natural spiritual dad wanted it that way but my adoption my resurrection changed everything let me tell you about my dad when my real father hated me, left me dead in my sin, dysfunction, and sickness, and addiction, and bitterness, and resentment, and selfishness, and immorality, my new dad just swooped in with power over death, resurrected me, and made me alive, made me his child. Do you remember that moment? Those of you in here, do you remember that moment, the day that Heavenly Dad came to get you from the orphanage of dead souls? Do you remember it? Do you remember the day he made you alive, gave you the gift of faith, and then began to transform you with his spiritual DNA through the Holy Spirit? Do you remember the rush of emotions? That moment your soul was resurrected? I mean, who knows, maybe for some of you, it's happening right now. Maybe Heavenly Dad has swung by your orphanage. Maybe this very moment, he's resurrecting you. If it is this moment, welcome to your new family. I can tell you from my own personal experience, our dad is awesome. <laughs> He is way better than your other dad. Just wait. You'll see. Heavenly dad, thank you so much that through resurrection power, you transform us. You make us alive. You raise us up who were dead 
and you seat us right next to you. Thank you so much for our adoption day. And I pray for those that may be here today that you may be adopting at this very moment. I pray the gift of faith you give them will be strong and powerful and convincing. Because you, Dad, are awesome. You're way better than my old dad. And I can't wait to tell other people about what you've done for me.